All right, um, we're back. This is our second panel. Uh, and ag again, a really great bridge from the first, um, I think, to, to thinking about what was uh, happening in the late 20th century uh, around black social clubs here in Chicago and thinking about in this uh, present moment um, what kinds of things are happening. So uh, Critical Collectivities is uh, moderated by Craig Stevenson. Um, and I'll just call you a designer and a civic engagement uh, <laughs> connector and expert, uh, is gonna moderate this panel. And then we also have Augie, I'm sorry, your last name, and Mua, um, and Dr. Nick Alder. Um, and they're gonna talk to us about uh, their um, work, uh, the Dirty Laundry uh, Project, Pop-Up Project, and Party Noir. So I'm gonna pass it off to you. Hi, everyone. It was a great uh, first panel, right? Yes. Yeah, give it up to the first panel again. <laughs> so when Maida asked me to be on uh, a moderator for this panel, I was like, what is, why is Maida asking <laughs> me to be on this panel, right? Um, I've been lucky enough and to learn and work with Maida uh, with the parks. And the original project that we worked together, well, we directly got the chance to work together because I've been doing like uh, Tip Fest and, and uh, their Unity Walks and all these things that's around gatherings. But we got a chance to work together on the cultural asset mapping project. And this is when Maida, I have a thick skull, you all. This is when Maida and, uh, and Paula Geary and a lot of uh, the folks from uh, the black researchers, Glennis Green, they started putting me on to the fact that we needed to start uh, having our narratives digitally, right? We needed to, we need, and so Maida had the black social map, and then uh, camp was this project that we tried to roll out across the city to show that the need, one, was the need for black social spaces and brown social spaces, um, spaces for those who are traditionally marginalized. And it was rolling out around the time of uh, the pandemic. So we were doing engagement during the pandemic on Zoom and things like that. But one of the most important factors, and I think this ties directly into the last panel was, is that we were doing research. And in that research, we found that these collectives, these spaces, these venues, they had about a 10 year lifespan. All of them, they all had a 10, to, and it segues way into your work. Um, so I'm gonna introduce you all, but the, I wanted to kind of just set the stage because the 10 year lifespan was uh, factored in for two reasons, right? We either aged out or we didn't own the space. It's kind of just narrow down a lot of that research and data, right? That's why it's so important. And we didn't own our own narratives, right? So we couldn't produce that cultural value. So that's a lot of the things that we're gonna talk about um, throughout this conversation. So I'm gonna let you all introduce yourselves and the work that you do and whatever fun fact that you all wanna start the conversation with. Okay, I'll kick us off and get us started. Peace, y'all. I'm Dr. Nick um, Alder. I am co-founder of Party Noir as well as the co-founder or the founder of a space called Radical Healing Lab. And I think um, to ground myself in my introduction, I wanna share two lineages about myself. Um, the first is um, I'm of, I'm the first of a generation after um, migration from the West Indies to the United States. And so there's a, a connection of um, dance hall and bashment culture that feels very particular to my upbringing um, I'm also from New York, and so I'm thinking about Brooklyn. I'm thinking about Flatbush Avenue. I'm thinking about the large sound systems and just booming, booming music and the gathering of people in that space. Um, it's also very fitting that we are in a church house because I'm from church folk. <laughs> um, so the other side of my people are people who um, are really deeply grounded in a, a lineage of black women's care work that was centered in the church and gathering and bringing people together. Um, and not just gathering, but doing so in spaces that felt like it was centered around care, it was centered around healing, it was centered around sort of creating sanctuary and spaces of release. And I think that that, to me, feels like the foundation of how 
I think about the work that I'm doing now with Party Noir and have been doing for al almost 10 years. Um, fun fact, um, I'll tell y'all my, my astrology for the astrology folks in the space. Um, my son is an Aquarius. Um, I'm a Capricorn moon and a Virgo rising. Do with that information what you will. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, I'm a Virgo, so I don't, I don't. <laughs> um, We get things done as get, the, the, that's done. the energy is like orderly. Uh, so so my, my actual real government name is Augustine Benjamin Chimelu Mua. Um, born and raised in Chicago, but I was African before it was cool. Um, so my mom was like, nah, 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 nah. We're gonna take some heat off this boy. We're gonna call him Augie. Right? So friends, uh, family members, people call me Augie. Um, Lifelong Chicagoan. I'm excited to be in this space because I feel like intimate spaces like this is where the real magic happens. Um, for 20 years, I was an educator for CPS, probably about nine years as a turnaround principal, going into schools and basically turning them around, quote unquote, meaning that, yeah, like you go in and you say, this place is not working, let's fix it, but you don't include the community in that. Drank that Kool-Aid for some years and then had an epiphany moment uh, when I was on a 12-day fast. And that epiphany moment was, I'm in an education space, but something doesn't feel right because it feels too performance-based, it feels too corporatized. Um, and like I said, had opportunity to rise through the ranks downtown and do all the things. But I just felt like the ambition, the hustle, the entrepreneurship that I displayed to turn those schools around, I had never tried that in my own life. So I wanted to do that before you know, I left this place. So I'm actually new to entrepreneurship. Uh, you see these gray hairs. <laughs> but it's been a fun journey for me, and one that I like to model for my son, who's back there, um, low key. So Ogo Chukwu, what's up? I had to call him by his Nigerian name. Anyways, uh, my wife and I run a detergent company, actually, called Denobi Detergent. Um, and we're a detergent brand. Our whole focus is um, we wanted to create something that really cleaned, but that was really clean period, point blank. And when I think about that, and then what brought us into doing dirty laundry, everything for, and what brought me into education, everything's been about an equity push in our community. Everything's been about how can we do the things that we know are gonna empower us. Um, I was, you know, no diss against the other schools or with other demographics, I was always super excited about working with um, black children, black educators. Um, just with our brand, even though like we get tons of folks that kind of tell us how to market ourselves and you can't just be this, we get really, really excited when we bring on customers that look like us and build community with them. So our project, which I know we'll probably get into, kind of happened just based off of that passion and that love for just wanting to create space, be in space with our people. So I'm, I'm gonna jump off two things that you all said and, and really gonna jump into this critical collectives piece. So, I help to facilitate a group called Open Architecture Collaborative Chicago. Most of the time it's like OA, Open Architecture Chicago, OAC Chicago, some, I mean, less familiarized with it, but a lot of people know some of this work that we do. We do this, uh, this work called Poetic Platforms. And Poetic Platforms is, all, I grew up in the church, Corey and I grew up in the church. Corey is a part of OAC, John Swain in the front is part of OAC. We're, we're quiet designers. Right, and so we wanted to figure out like how do we get how do we how do we get the word out that we're in this thing? So we wanted to do this event called Poetic Platforms, and we and the parks were doing platforms in the park, and they had these little platforms out here, and we we were like I got seven hundred dollars. We're talking about entrepreneurship, and we couldn't afford Dwayne out here. We couldn't afford Dwayne. We couldn't afford Dwayne Power for for one of our pop ups. So we were like, who can we get? And I had been doing work with uh, Sean. Sean is a, um, uh, another another DJ, and then uh, Kahari B. And I was like, look, I got seven hundred dollars. I'm gonna split it between you all. We gonna pop up in the park, and we are gonna bring people together, right? So talking about the entrepreneurial things. One, the entrepreneurship about creating critical collectives, but then the other piece about the importance of it. So I love that, that word critical collectives because it, it's, it's, it's not passive collectives. It means that people are actually diving in and actually engaging 
uh, which, I, which I could appreciate. Um, the way that we sort of fell into the space um, was we actually, interestingly enough, there was a, there's a, um, a laundry service in Brooklyn that uses our detergent to do their service or whatever. So when I was in Brooklyn kind of dealing with them, I just saw what they did to a laundromat. I mean, they literally took it and turned it into that place with the speakers out. They had a patio in the back, and then they were giving jobs to the community like crazy. And I'm like, what is going on? And I'm coming into this with like a sort of civic-minded approach to looking at this, and I'm saying, this works. I come back to Chicago, um, and I was actually fasting again. And I run into Eric Williams from the Silver Room, and he's like, how's business? Asking about the detergent company. I'm like, uh, business is going well. I mean, we competing with Procter & Gamble, so you know we getting murdered out here in these streets. But that's a whole nother thing, but we're doing okay. We're making, we making strides. And I told him, like, man, what would it look like to have just a space, man, where people could just come and chill, but then get their stuff done? And that's when he told me, reach out to this person. Let's, let's, let's make a play. And we made a play, and we ended up acquiring a space. And honestly, I mean, when you talk about like critical engagement, people will come in there. I mean, you can't get more critical than sitting across from somebody having a conversation, folding your drawers, right? Like, you know, the intimacy and the exchanges. So then we started saying, okay, well, what does it look like to really activate this place and make it rock? So we were able to do some things that pull some folks together, had great conversations in that space, um, really, really started to solidify a different approach. And what I believe happened for me was um, it was a bigger look at economic development patterns and gentrification too. Because I think that one of the main things I noticed was, man, where are the spaces where you don't need $50 to enter? Um, our space was a space where you can come in with $5 or less than $5 and you can be. So it leaves me with this reality check, even as, as much as I like harmony and, 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 and niceties, it leaves me with this reality check that um, the cost of, of customer service, the cost of love in just spaces is going gone up just as much as inflation, period, point blank. So we got to think strategically about the way that we do things economically in our communities if we want to solidify those spaces to continue to exist. Um, so, I, you know, I think for us when we first started in 2015, we're coming up on that 10 year mark that you started off with. and. I'm like, 10 years, is that, is that, is that the time where the, the end happens? Or, you know, you gotta give me more research as to what happens, how does one st sustain beyond the 10 year? Um, but if I'm being honest and truthful, um, when we started, we, I don't necessarily know that the, the economics of it was the first thing that we thought about. I think we were first thinking about creating a safe space for femmes, for black queer women, for trans folks, for non-binary folks. And um, it's an a amazing kind of situation that happened that um, from throwing one party that started off with maybe 150 people, um, over the course of 10 years, we've been able to produce events that have been patronized by thousands of people. And with that, we've been able to kind of create platforms to um, just uplift the work of creative artists who are also queer, trans, non-binary folks. Um, I see some of the people who have uh, blessed our decks with your music in this space, uh, Dwayne Powell, Sherelle, um, and I'm thinking about the ways that like, not only, so when we started, I was a, a broke grad student. <laughs> and quite frankly, um, this is not thinking about the economics, I was able to sustain myself and pay my rent because of Party Noir as a broke grad student. And so the evolution of the work to be able to, to move from that space to it is now a part of an ecosystem of work that I do that I don't actually, I'm an entrepreneur, I don't actually do anything else but work for myself. And Party Noir fits into that, to, into that structure, into that ecosystem. And um, to me, it feels like we've created this kind of model or template that a lot of different um, collectives have sort of been able to adapt where there is this, this, this uh, pathway to creating uh, economic stability for ourselves, you know, I'm not, as an entrepreneur, there's moments of instability. Um, we're talking about inflation, and we're talking about being in a moment of, um, there are times when we, when we are not being able to pay ourselves. And um, I think in that, our, one, of our, our, one of the things that we sort of really pride ourselves is being able to be able to, to um, provide the platform for our folks. 
Um, and to pay them above and beyond what many venues in Chicago are paying their DJs, their artists, their creatives. And we know that because we have those folks on our team. Um, and so yeah, I think it's been an evolution of thinking about the economics of the work. Um, but it, I, t if I'm being honest, we were thinking about community first and the money came after. You know, um, they were talking on the previous panel about the value prop. And we're, we're, we're talking about community. And sometimes the value prop <laughs> and the community, choosing between the two, making sure that they both are thriving, <laughs> right? Um, we've had our challenges with the value prop and the models and trying to always redo our models and things like that. So I just want to speak to you all. Like, how do you all go about, one, creating a business, finding the model, right? You got to discover the model. You, you, you put something down on a business plan and then you experiment and that ain't it, right? And then at the same time, you're nurturing the community and you're helping the community to thrive. So can you talk about those two tension points? I'll go first. So, so, so I would say, uh, for me, what I'm learning about the value prop is that it's the kindest thing you could do to, for, for yourself as a, as a thinker uh, and as an imaginer. Um, and I think that uh, oftentimes, sometimes we get told, and this is just my humble opinion, but I've had some experiences now to sort of condition this opinion. But sometimes we think that being focused on other is sort of, and being focused on others is great. We want to be focused on our community. All of us have this, this tide in, in our existence. But to not think about the value prop to me shows, um, for me at this point in business, maybe not, not, a, not enough self-worth with myself as a business person, right? Um, you know, we were just having this conversation. It's just like, okay, well, as we go on to do the next space, like, what does that then look like? Now, I get the bootstrapping, but like the young man earlier said, earlier said you don't necessarily have to completely bootstrap. Because there are people out here, there are relationships out here that will help you. And when you think about bootstrapping, what the first thing you've done is now you've eliminated your social media manager. You've eliminated your program. You've eliminated these different positions and roles that you really need to come up with a thorough plan. Like, y'all, I'm an educator, so I'm taking this experience in as a businessman and looking at it from that standpoint like, oh, yeah, the curriculum I'm writing in my mind is crazy because I already see it. It's like I can have conversations with the, one, of, one of my mentors who's, who's the creator of OxyClean Orange Glow. And I know what they raised to get that company started, and I know all of the different roles that they had solidified. Now, I'm not saying they didn't have moments of instability, but they started with a plan that didn't just involve them, it involved others, so that they can bring something great to the community and really, really move fast. So my, my, the thing I tell myself at this point is, when I go to the table to eat, I don't just come with a spoon. If it's steak at that table, I gotta come with a fork, a knife, a soup spoon, a, a, like I gotta have all my utensils. And I think that that's super important for us to recognize and internalize as we go to venture to serve the community. Cause you can't, it's hard to serve the community by yourself. Um, and to add to that, I think about, um, you know, the, the challenge of doing cultural work and wanting to be heart-centered, wanting to be care-centered, and not always wanting to be sort of like capitalistic in sort of the approach to doing the work, and it feels like a challenge. It feels hard. The tension is always there. <laughs> it's always there. Um, and I think for us, I'm thinking back to you know when we first started. Um, I think the model that we that we offered was a little bit different than what was happening in 2015 with other party spaces where um, we were charging a cover for folks to get into the door, and um, Quite frankly, since we started, that cover didn't change up until last year. So we had gone through many pandemics, saw inflation happening, and you know, at some point had to decide that like, in order to do this work, it didn't make sense for us to be martyrs, for us to, to, to starve ourselves in order to create space. It, it, if it's going to be joy-centered, our joy also, our humanity, what we need, also needs to be centered in the work that we're doing. And um, to your point about sort of like bringing in partners, I think one thing that has helped us, helped us to keep the space accessible in terms of our cost is to seek out aligned partners who, um, in my opinion, have not tried to sort of like do anything to the brand. They, they don't want to come, they don't want to change it, they don't want to 
they don't want to insert, they don't want to bring, bring big signs. You've never come to a party noir space and seen an advertisement. That doesn't mean that we didn't get support from, let's say, a brand like Red Bull. Um, I'm thinking about the ways that we are tr trying to align strategically with folks who are um, happy to support and to, ex to expand the work that we're doing without sort of tainting or uh, trying to sort of overrun the, the space that we're trying to create for the folks that we, we're creating space for. Um, Augie, you basically, I'm gonna talk about teamwork. You basically mentioned that you had to come with a fork, a knife, a plate, <laughs> a chair, right? Like you had to come, you had to come with all these different things. And um, one I thought was interesting is that, you know, your business partner is your wife. And then I read that you all have four children. Now I'm listening to the fact that you were a turnaround principal. I, I was a teacher, I was an educator. I left out of the classroom the same thing. It's like, hey man, I'm doing, I was taught entrepreneurship. I'm doing hundreds of business plans. I'm like, yo, I haven't never, I've never tested this out. You know, like, I've never done this on my own. Well, I have before that, but I, I started to thirst about it. But you have a team, you got your family life, that's your team, right? You have your, everybody that you work with. Dr. Nick, we, I was talking about some of your earlier collaborators, right? Like, uh, we, Corey and I find ourselves in many communities. We find ourselves in, in some of you all. Part, party noir, you yes. are, right, part yes. noir parties. You are, right. Noir parties, some of those early party noir parties. And so, you know, just talk about the importance of teamwork and how it evolves. Maybe even some roles have to shift <laughs> at certain times. Teamwork is a, is, a, is a puzzle, right? It's like a Rubik's Cube sometimes. So I, I think I'll, I'll say about teamwork that it feels um, essential to being able to sustain a space for 10 years. Um, you talked about uh, sort of how things evolve and you know, when Party Noir started, we were, fa we were founded by three members. And within that second year, um, we found ourselves with two members and needing to sort of like grow our team because our capacity has just the two people who co-founded it we, I don't think we would have made it with just the two of us. Um, and I feel grateful that over the time, um, one of the things that we, that we um, began to offer was an internship. And so we would get folks who were in college here in Chicago who were interested in sort of space making. And they would start off interning with us for a couple months and never leave. <laughs> um, so they would transition from being our interns to now being our full on collaborators. So, um, I'll call their names because it feels important. My co-founder, Ray Chardonnay, DJ extraordinaire, just important to um, what it means to create sound in house music in Chicago, period. Um, the, our art director, our colleague Car Carly Thornton, who also founded a space called Froskate. Um, our social media le lead, who turned to an extraordinary DJ, uh, Jenea, also known as DJ Diaspora the most newest member of our collective, Lyric Newborn, uh, the person who is documenting and sort of archiving our work. Um, and to me, we've had many other people who supported and collaborated with us over the years. Um, I'm missing a very important person, my partner, DeFrance Smart, who is our um, safety and community uh, care lead, who makes sure that like our space is actually as safe as we say that we're going to make it. Um, and I think the collaboration, the, the part of collaboration that feels important, um, someone on the, the panel earlier talked about like each person bringing their individual skills and that being the thing that proliferates the space. Um, I'm coming in with sort of a, a background as um, a psychologist, y'all calling me Dr. Nick because I am a doctor. <laughs> um, and thinking about um, this, this, cent this way of centering care, to me that feels really important to how we do the work. It, it differentiates us from a lot of spaces because I'm, I actually know what I'm talking about. <laughs> when I'm talking about centering, centering care and what it means to like actually do that work. Um, and then the different people that I've named, they are all coming in as um, just creatives, artists in their own right, and lending their skills, their capacity to our work, and that is what makes Party Noir what it is. And so the collaboration to me, it feels like it, it, it is um, this idea around co-creation, about us kind of, kind of coming together and continuing to like evolve this space to create the thing that we um, desire to see in 2015, what we're seeing right now in this moment, and hopefully next year you see me in 10 years, um, continuing to do this to do this work. So you're going 
20 years, 30 years. This, is, this is quiet. Um, anybody in the building uh, ever heard of the story of Exodus? Um, the Exodus story? All right, so um, you remember that the trip was supposed to take how many days? Like, it took these jokers 40 years. <laughs> And, and, and I think uh, so much of it is because uh, people don't really understand what teamwork really is. Um, in our community, so I'm a former backpack hip hopper in Chicago, all the things, creative myself, um, did a lot of stuff, right? But one of the things that I remember is this statement that came from the East Coast called, yo, word is born. <laughs> so that's how we sometimes show up in, in meetings and, and, and ways to get stuff done. And you know for sure I showed up like that with my wife. My wife was just like, oh, okay, yeah, you were running to one of these meetings. I took this money out the account. I hired Erica, our chemist. She created this thing, and, and, um, and I'm just going to do it. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to support you. Word is born. And my wife and I really, really, really struggled because not only is it me and her growing in our relationship personally, navigating the ups and downs of having children, navigating the fact that she's not from Chicago and is just like, Chicago, a different beast. Um, all those things, plus we got people that are depending on us to be clear. And that to me was like, that is, that is, that is the, the exercise that we had to go through probably for about three or four years before we finally got to the point where we could really say, okay, we solidified a business that's moving toward the market it needs to move toward profitability wise. So for us, we got a whole bunch of folks that, uh, help us do what we do. But I think, um, again, I just go back to like, my real agenda for doing this is really, I think about my children and I think about giving them a real education. I think that entrepreneurship is nothing but um, you having an idea and a thought and then actually employing, right? So um, there's a guy that's on the internet, he always talks about the four levels of value, it's a business management term. And they always talk about um, um, imagination, communication, unification, and they talk about uh, implementation. And, you know, people may get a little queasy when I say this, but they say that sometimes the implementation part is probably like the lower of the value systems. I'm not saying I subscribe to that completely, but I will say, I will, <laughs> I will say, I will say that what we found in our case was my wife and I had to literally take ourselves and say, okay, where are we at right now in this stage? And then does that make sense in terms of us employing that skill set? She would go from like, and I, if she's watching, I'm sorry, but she would go from like imagination to implementation. No communication, no unification. So then how's, how's it gonna run? How's it gonna operate in a way that's effective? So now behind the scenes, it's like, okay, when you start thinking about dealing with government contracts, when you start dealing with like, you know, uh, uh, black labeling for folks and uh, white labeling for folks and stuff like that, it takes a whole lot when it comes to distribution deals, things like that. But when we got to that laundromat and having to be on, like, shout out to everybody that runs a brick and mortar and it has a stand there every single day, learn people's names, really experience the community. It is a it is an exercise in just in giving like like no other. Um, so <laughs> um, I'm gonna come back to implementation. <laughs> um, so I have an identical twin brother, if you all haven't seen that, I'm in two places in one time right now at the moment, right? And one of the beauties of that is, is that we've had to collaborate our entire life. And I tell people, I was like, whatever people learn in their first seven years of marriage, because they usually say that, we tried to kill ourselves, we tried, I mean, like, our battles were epic, right? So, so one of the things I want to talk about, I'm going to come back to implementation, because I do think that people jump from imagination they jump past communication and unification because that unification piece is is super important and I don't think you can properly implement. But let's talk about like collaboration. They talked about concentric circles of relationships and getting people to work. Corey's always like, hey man, did you get an MOU? Because <laughs> I talk and I start generating ideas. He was like, did you write that down? <laughs> you know, so, so, so how, talk about collaboration, people filling in your gaps because we all have strong suits and some folks, you know, a lot of us have a lot of weak points. So, so, you know, talk about collaboration and how you get to build what you are able to build through collaborating, building the teams. I guess this is kind of still on that team piece. Yeah, I would, I would I'd go pretty quick. I just think that collaboration and communication go hand in hand. Um, I just feel like uh, 
communication is so super important because, you know, some people think that communication is just what you say, um, but it, communication is actually, you know, a thing being put out there, but then somebody receiving it too. Mm -hmm. So the reception of it, the emotional intelligence of it, um, I just remember even when we first started, my wife comes from a career as an inter international auditor, actually. So, you know, she had a, a, a hardcore corporate accounting experience. And literally, we would be talking about product development. And she's like, well, I added that. To, I put that on your calendar. And I'm just like, what? <laughs> like, I was like, we all over the place really dealing with families. I'm hugging on moms. Like, and then I grew up that way as well. What are you talking about? A calendar invite. So it literally becomes being emotionally intelligent enough to say there's something that needs to happen or there's an expectation that needs to be met. How am I putting this person in the best position to mm -hmm. receive it? It's the reception of it. That's, that's, that to me is, is, is like the foundation or education terms, the prerequisite, right, of, of collaboration. If you don't have that, how you got unification? And then how do you have implementation that doesn't exhaust itself uh, where you can't sustain it? So I think it's interesting because um, there's this saying that you shouldn't go into business with your friends. However, we are all speaking from a space where yeah. we've got lots of relationships with the people that we are collaborating with. And, um, you know, I'm thinking about maybe my brain on this in this conversation is more on the, the relational side or thinking about sort of, you know, what is it, what, what's required to um, allow uh, people in relationship to kind of grow um, and to be able to kind of like evolve within the personal in ways that will inevitably transform the relationship within the kind of like business or in the professional. Um, and I think that, you know, against that saying that you shouldn't go into a relationship with friends, um, I actually really think that it was a part of my life's mission to be in relationship to the people that I work with in a very intimate way. And, um, you know, back to my question about what's, uh, what is required to allow us to grow is like, I'm thinking about myself when we started Party Noir in 2015 as a 20 something year old. And who I am today is a whole different, I, I, I'm just a different, a different version of myself, a different person. And I feel really grateful that I have a team of people who really just like, allowed me to grow into who I am as a person and then to implement that within the spaces of work that, that we do together. Um, and when, when I'm thinking about some of the like practical or like, you know, what are the things that I bring to the team? I'm the, the systems person. I'm the person who's like, okay, what is the system to develop about what, what are we doing here and how can I make it into a system so that there's a, a map for us. We are not just kind of operating with our eyes closed. Um, and I think about maybe my counterpart, Ray, who I see as the people person. She is talking to the folks. She is getting the people to come to the party. She is um, talking to the people that we are collaborating with. She's the people person. And so, yeah, I'm think I, I just think about like the ways that we've also allowed ourselves to grow as individual people, to have to actually grow in relationship to each other, to really move through hard times. Like we've been through some things mm -hmm. as people who have been collaborators for 10 years. It's, and so to me, it's like th there's a real life, there's real life that's happening outside of the work. And it feels important to be able to kind of be in a space where we are constantly allowing ourselves to change, to grow, and to evolve, and to do that in ways that feel supportive to what we each need. And it might be different at times. Uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna speak to evolution. How do you all see your collectives evolving right now? So uh, for Dirty Laundry, like I said, it was a pop-up. Um, and it was a pop-up that uh, we were in partnership with the uh, University of Chicago that a land on over there. Um, and um, the hope, I think, for everyone was that it was gonna be something that was there for a long time because it literally is the last uh, like laundromat in Hyde Park. And a lot of folks are like, well, laundromat, like what's so special about that? But when we start looking at businesses like laundromats leaving, there's so much research out there that shows that that means that the community for sure is changing. Um, even down to the fact where I talked to so many uh, landowners, uh, building owners in the area on 53rd Street, 
who depend on the laundromat because they don't have the infrastructure to even put machines into the into the uh, into their into their buildings so that people could just wash their clothes. Think about that, like the basic need of being able to wash clothes. But then also, like when you go into most laundry mats, you see the you see the environment and what does it look like? The environment of it just looks like real vintage. We're gonna keep it vintage and it's machines first and people second. So let me smash in as many machines as possible because it's about how many rotations I'm gonna get on this machine, right? When there are so many ways to make money in a laundry mat, but we still work. Let's get these machines popping, right? Let's not sell coffee in there. Let's not have a cafe feel. Let's not have Wi-Fi in there. Let's not have great um, vibes, products. People like Dwayne coming out and like spending, right? Like children's books. Just think of like that space. That's an essential space, and people coming in there literally saying, "Well, draws on the table again." I mean, it's an intimate space that people depend on, right? For us. When it came down to it and rubber met the road, unfortunately, an investment group was able to come in and basically toss some cash out there and say, well, this is what we, this is what we're, this is what we're posing because we want this space. And it just taught me a lesson of how important um, the ownership of the property is for me, for the type of business that I want to run. But it also taught me that um, the reality of it is that, and this is what we've been talking about here, is just this, this vibe, this essence, this energy, this art that comes along with, with who we are when we decide to have space together is something that you can have in multiple places. So I've started to work with probably about 20 laundry mats right now in the city. Uh, we were rated, I think, top 15 so far sound, intimate concerts or whatever um, um, in our little laundry mat. So we want to bring that to other spaces. Not because it's a laundromat, even though a laundromat is an economic machine. I can't, I have to continue to say that because the cost of customer service has gone up so much that we got to find strategic ways to make sure we maintain the income that we need to be able to maintain those spaces. But again, like it's working with these different institutions to let them know when people come in here and they depend on this place and they come back to this place. No matter, I don't care if it's a community in Pilsen, I don't care if it's a community in West Side of Chicago, whatever, like these are community spaces. So we have to almost rebrand something as simple as a laundromat, right? Like even a barbershop, y'all, like you walk into a barbershop and a barbershop is dope because we have a lot of great conversations. But I mean, like when is the dude from Pakistan coming in to get a fade at the spot over here? You know what I mean? Like it's not that, inter it's not that intercultural connection. When we have spaces that create intercultural connection, we got spaces that create um, um, safety, um, uh, in, uh, intellectual and creative, cre like intellectual activity and creativity, sparking conversations politically and all those things. Like those things are super important to have in a community. So for us, we're moving forward and actually when we reopen it, we're gonna reopen as a nonprofit with that economic engine to help support it so that again, like and no diss against like any other nonprofit owner, but I just told myself as we do this, I don't want to um, do the gala every year where I have to always show the pain, where I gotta show like do the feed the children thing. It's like, look at the flies going in his mouth. I'm not doing that. Um, there needs to be a strategic and a smart way for us to actually create a business model that sustains us. And then we can do the galas and things like that with a different narrative. Um, so. Like I said, it's just a way to combat and be innovative with this idea that this, this cost of our socialization and, 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 uh, and, and good service, customer service, has just gone up dramatically. In thinking about our evolution, um, I know I don't look like it, but I kind of operate as a queer elder um, in a lot of the spaces that we are creating because I tend to be of the oldest people in the room. And um, I think about, you know, at, at what point does nightlife or social, um, you know, cultural work that looks like creating space look like event production? Um, at what point do I actually need to hand this over to be stewarded by, let's say, Lyric, Jenea, Carly, the folks who are, who are younger than, than I am? Um, and I think about um, in this evolution or being in a space where we sort of like, have gained a set of skills, a set of um, cultural knowledge that we are in communication with our younger people to be able to kind of like um, co-create this, this space, but also to pass on what it is that we've learned in the years that we've been doing the work. Um, and 
we operate similar to you where it is very, um, it's a pop-up style. Thankfully, we've had a pretty, um, pretty stable home base at the Promontory in the South Side. Um, we've also had a, a two-year residency in Brooklyn. We've been to Miami, so we've, we've taken part in the war, taken part in a lot of spaces. And um, there is like an, a, a, maybe a vision, a vision of evolution that looks like um, being in spaces where black people are internationally, I would love to see Party Noir um, in Brazil. I think that is one of the places that I feel like black people would really eat the dance floor um, in terms of Party Noir. And then there's also this, um, we had been talking about this earlier, but um, the idea that like, this is a, a current, this is a part of our current evolution where um, the club is wonderful in some ways. And also, as we're living in these very tender and treacherous times, people are needing more than just to twerk in the club. And so what it looks like to create space that's open air that we can dance outside with our feet touching grass, we're, 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 we're dreaming of it right now. We're trying to evolve and, and find some ways to do it right now. Um, and, and then there's also the evolution of what you just said around not owning the, the, the property. So, you know, we're working with venues who we have these long-standing relationships with, but we're not the owners. So at the end of the day, even if we are in a space where we feel like we have some kind of like equitable relationship, we're not taking, we definitely aren't taking home the, the most of the money that's created in the space that we're making. And um, I don't think the physical manifestation would look like a nightclub per se, but I think the, the part that is the cultural hub, the place that creativity for black queer people proliferates, I think we should have that. I think that should be ours. I think that we should co, um, I think it should be a cooperative, a space that like we are thinking outside of the reins of capitalism and thinking about how to be collective about stewarding um, a space for black creativity that is queer, that is trans, that is non-binary. So those are all of the reasons for evolution and I hope that maybe there's some folks in the room who have knowledge or skills or money and want to talk to me about how to be able to create some of those things. Man, this is some fantastic stuff. Um, both of you all curate moments of pleasure, which is very temporary, right? But you're talking about physical stewardship. How do you see yourselves continuing? Well, one, how did you all decide that, right? Like, how, do, how did you decide to center pleasure or to center joy in your model? But then it evolves. Right? They talked earlier about it evolving. How do you see yourself doing it? You talked about being an elder. We talked about that too, like we're OAC. The, I'm like the old dude on the crits, right? I'm getting invited to the schools to talk about student work, right? And so, and so like, I, I really do feel like intentionally we are creating the space for something else to come up beyond, um, you know, from now, right, something emergent. So you're all curating pleasure, and then how do you see that emergent space moving forward? Um, I think, so thinking about Party Noir, um, if you're an OG, then you know that we talked a lot about black joy when we first started. And to me, that feels very foundational, and it's still a part of the work that we do. Um, and why joy, why pleasure? Because it felt and still feels like necessary. It feels like um, a, a sort of act of survival. It feels like resistance at times. Um, it feels like the thing that's just kind of getting us through as I'm thinking about the times that we've sort of like been able to continue to create the space. Um, our first year was in 2015. We know what happened in 2016 in terms of a political landscape of, of things. Uh, we're headed into another space of just feeling very just, it, it feels very hard to access joy. It feels very hard to access pleasure. And um, yeah, it, it, to me, it, it, it has felt like a lifeline for me personally. And to be able to kind of create a collective lifeline for us to be able to access these moments of joy and access these moments of pleasure while living through some very treacherous and trying, trying times. Um, yeah, I would say for me, when I think about um, curating spaces of joy, um, and maybe this is because I still am working to reconcile being a turnaround, like, school principal, right? Like, you know, did fabulous, fabulous work at that time, but I feel like 
it didn't truly just sit with honoring the whole picture. Um, every adult in this room has an iceberg. Um, you got things that you show, right? So you may have on a red shirt, you may have on a cap or whatever, but it's some stuff underneath there. Um, and I just think that it's just not enough spaces to really support us as adults. Um, I think that, um, you know, the go-to strategy is, well, let's, let's invest in, in the youth. Uh, and I think that we definitely, for sure, have to do that all day, every day. But then not a lot of folks are talking about, what about some of these adults that are out here sort of grappling in their roles, trying to support the community, trying to pioneer, trying to do the tough work. We live in a city like Chicago where we literally got to figure out how to piecemeal school experiences for our kids, um, got to figure out how to deal with you know, policing situations that we have right now, knowing there's this sort of quiet internal strike, dealing with the change of political times, dealing with, dealing with, the dealing with, and the dealing with. So we got all these things going on. It's super, super, super important for us to have space just for us to be able to have a moment to just share and to have a conversation. I remember it takes me back to the first time that Dwayne came over and I was like, yo, we got this laundry man, man. I just inherited all these machines. Uh, we, gotta, we gotta do something cool up here. And I was just like, well, Dwayne, how are you? And literally, he just started airing out his dirty laundry. Like, this is how I am. You want to know how I am? This is what time it is. And I was just honored to be able to receive that for a person that if I see him and we just say, we ha say I'm out and I see Dwayne, I'm like, ah, oh, bro, and we dap up and then we keep pushing. But that's that surface of that iceberg. And the reality is that some sort of way there got to be spaces where we can get under there for each other because how we... How do we have community if we don't have that for the folks that are actually running and supporting and leading these communities? Um, you know, you have all sort of other stuff pop up and I just think that we don't have enough places that's informal, right? Like everything ain't gotta be therapy even though we know we need therapy, but what are the informal spaces where we could just let our, let our I don't have no hair, but you know what I'm saying, let it down. <laughs> um, this, is, this is the last question. And and, and, and it just kind of came, because we keep mentioning Dwayne. And Dwayne is a cultural treasure, right? And, Period. And, I mean, and, and one of the things that sort of was an epiphany was when Dwayne w went up and he was performing at Millennium Park. And I'm, I'm sure you've done this multiple times, right, or, or whatever, but I feel like without Maida or some of these other people in DKs, like there, there are people who like go before us, right? Um, who sort of create the space for us to play, right? So who are some of those people? And then after the, after you answer those questions, because I do think that's important. Six Hundred One was in front of us; they inspired. I think indirectly, some of that artwork that they had up there kind of inspired some of Corey's artwork and up from the flyers, right? So there are some people who have like gave you layups or gave you the assist, right, for you to shoot. Who are those people? And then one last thing we're going to do before we start taking um, questions from the audience. Um, so for us, um, you know, we were Chicago's best dance party two years in a row and then won some other things. And the dance part of the party feels very important because without Dwayne, without a Sean Alvarez, there is no Ray Chardonnay. So we, don't, we wouldn't be able to say that we are a dance party because you gave us what we needed to have in order to be that dance party. Um, and then um, there's a recent piece that was in the Chicago Reader. Reader? Yes, it was in the Reader um, that did a sort of retrospective of queer spaces in Chicago and features party noir and what I think is like my fairy queer godmothers, um, Pat McCombs and Vera Washington, who ran the space called Executive Suite, and I think they still do events now. Um, I feel so much gratitude to be able to have been in conversation um, in a public space with Ray and I and Vera Washington and Pat McCombs. That's wild to me that that even happened. <laughs> Um, but Executive Suite feels like another one of those sort of like legacy. I do the, I'm able to do the work that I'm able to do because there was a Vera and there was a Pat McCombs. I wrote this down because I thought he was going to ask this question. <laughs> um, there was a party um, that was happening and sort of like sunsetting right as Party Noir was getting started called Lesby Friends. And 
Fun times. I I, <laughs> um, I can't. I there was just fun times. I feel like um, I wish that there would have been more space for us to be able to cross pollinate. But as they as they were sunsetting, we were just kind of getting started. And I think that again, without their sort of without the foundation that they laid, there would be no party noir. Um, we also spoke about um, the founder or one of the co-owners of Nobody's Darling, Renata. Um, I can't remember Renata's last name right now, but um, she once ran a party in space called Brunch Remixed. And uh, <laughs> the way <laughs> that <laughs> this space to me gave me a vision of what, if I were to do Party Noir for 20 more years, what I would look like at 20, 20 years from now as a, can I create some church? As a, <laughs> some kids in here, as a bad B, we'll say bad B, you know what I'm saying when I say bad B. <laughs> as a bad B, queer, elder, actual, like actually elder in age, um, it just, it felt magical to be in a space where there were literally queer people in their 50s, 60s, they were day partying because we know, they, you know, they probably had to get to bed, whatever, but <laughs> um, it was a wonderful, it just, it gave a wonderful vision about what Party Noir could look like, should we, sustain this work for, let's say, 20, 30 years. Um, and so, yeah, those are the, the three names that I would like to call in terms of people who laid the foundation and kind of ran so that I could literally walk. <laughs> so, so for me, it's, uh, it's, it's, a little bit, it's a little bit different. Similar, but still a little bit different. Um, I gotta start by giving you a compliment because uh, even as I experience you like close up, I just admire your, your swag, your, your, your essence, um, the fact that you wear your, your, your identity and truth um, like sh throughout. Um, and I say that because for me personally, you know, again, um, you know, didn't have the greatest upbringing situation. Uh, father was a child soldier um, in uh, Biafra, which is one of the ugliest civil wars in Africa they don't talk about. Um, so about 2.5 million uh, Igbo people um, were, were killed. Uh, it was a, an attempted at genocide. And he came to America with this with this hope that he would have me, and then things would be smooth. But there was a lot of a lot of things going on in my household as a kid, um, and uh, my mom is also suffers from schizophrenia. So um, I learned real real early how to, for survival, assimilate. So for me, I always tell folks like, oh my gosh, like going into going into uh, a sort of corporate kind of structure was perfect for me. It was a perfect bait because I could go in and sort of like morph and chameleon into these different things. So I tell folks all the time, like, and this has been a huge part of my own therapy and journey, is, is um, admitting that I'm a recovering assimilator. Right? So I think about people around me that have really, really, really given me a ton of joy, have been the people that have been those little sort of like pings and reminders. No argue you really a creative. No argue you really an imaginer. Through this whole course, I'm running through schools, we got kids, and we doing all the things, right? But I was always connected with people like Dwayne. I was always connected with people like Nick Undefined. I was always connected with people like Otez. I was always connected with dope people like Eric Williams from The Silver Room, Megan, that's the creative director over there. Um, and these folks, um, were literally like damn near pleading with me, like just let yourself go, right? And I got a chance, lucky enough, I got a chance to sort of come out the rat race with some skills, cool, but I got a chance to come out that rat race and, and experience some of that freedom. I ain't never going back. <laughs> so um, I think about people like that as far as just inspiration. Um, technical folks, I gotta give a huge shout out to um, Jessica Gillespie. She does all of our PR, public relations work. Um, gotta give a huge shout out to my mentor, um, Joe Apple. Um, huge, uh, huge, huge, huge endearing thank you um, to um, just different folks. Man, I could go on and on and on with that, but I guess for me it's just, it's just you know, recognizing that identity matters so much because that's the secret sauce that you bring to whatever enterprise that you're on the cusp of running or any enterprise that you currently run. I love Pam's forethought of bringing someone up to dance. You want to do a reprise? <laughs> I'll just play. <laughs> um, do we have any questions uh, before we end the panel? I, this was a very rich conversation. Now, any questions? 
No? Huh? Hello. Um, yeah, I'm a DJ and kind of starting to get started with like helping organize events in Chicago myself. And it's just, um, it's, it isn't really a question, I'm just like grateful to hear both of you all speak and um, it kind of helped give me a little bit more of an insight about the need for community and um, building like across, instead of like trying to build upwards. So thank you both for just sharing. Thank you, tell us your DJ name. I go by Cobra B. <laughs> That's dope. Um, hey y'all, I am Tony. I'm a community curator for Write Down Collective and I was just gonna say that I appreciate a lot of uh, the work that Nick and the others do in regards to like, But both of you all emphasize the fact that spaces can't just be, you know, shaking your butt and all this other stuff, that these other things are super important, which like our work focuses on people writing, coming together and being able to get that stuff off their chest, right? Or being able to express themselves in a different way or through a different medium. And so I just wanted to thank you guys for shedding light on that and how important that is because I think anytime you say you're doing an event or whatever, people automatically like in their head thinking they're dancing and whatnot. And so thank you for putting emphasis on the fact that there are other roads to healing. Um, thank you, Tony. I feel like I just want to add real quick because, um, you know, doing the, the creating Party Noir as a space for, um, for healing or a, a space for dancing, I think about this sort of ancestral practice, it, the things that we've always known that we can do or that we can access to access healing. And so there's a somatic release that happens when we dance. But there are also these avenues of healing, such as what you do with um, Write Down Collective, where we're in a collective space of sort of like writing, um, expressing through poetry, expressing through music. And those are also equally as um, valuable as us being able to also shake some ass, so. But, but also too, it's the, it's the way to make stuff that we don't think, you know, you can shake your butt, shake your ass. You, we, you know, like those things that are really simple and practical, like something like that. So our whole mission is just like turning dirty laundry in the community. Um, and the reality of it is that like, it's just, we do all the things, but then also at the end of the day, it's just everybody, no matter what, no matter what race, socioeconomic background, whatever, whatever, has to do this task. So how do we make this task something that is um, not demeaning? How do we make it a, a self-care push and have all these different attributes? And real quick, um, there's a there's a um, there's an importance around um, us being in collective space together that feels really important. And, um, you know, I, some of y'all know this, I'm a psychologist or um, at one point practice sort of like mental health. And therapy is one way for us to access healing, but it's just one tool inside of a toolkit that we should be sort of like pulling from. And so whether it's sort of like being in spaces of gathering and belonging and, and community, because that is also a place for healing or accessing writing, poetry, dance, music, again, it's a, it's a part of all, it's a part of many things that we should be able to sort of like pull from to be able to access um, healing and liberation. So, oh, I, I had a question. Oh, you want to? Oh, um, so um, you all were talking about like the, just the need of space for uh, you all to kind of like restore and for the work that we do to be restorative. And this, is, this question just came up because I was watching uh, one of the partners, uh, Media Archives, I wanna get the name right. Is that right? I'm sorry. Media if it's Brain. Not, media Brain. Um, but they were showing Vernon Jarrett and that was somebody who always restored me um, growing up and stuff like that when I saw him in The Defender and The, and the Sun Times. So what is something that you read now, like when you're going through these these challenges that help restore and point you back north. Right now, currently, I'm actually reading a real difficult book that's uh, that's bringing a lot uh, to mind for me, um, and it's called The Great Kingdoms of Africa. Um, a buddy of mine that's studying uh, at Harvard, he found it in the book in the in the bookstore and was just like, I got to send this to you so that you can recognize that sometimes we give too much credit um, to uh, colonialism 
for um, executive functioning. Um, you know, um, um, they're not the originators of thinking uh, in a systematic way, um, and you gotta dial it back. Uh, because I think that as a black man, um, you know, in a city like Chicago that has this current case, this, that's, a, that's a case study of its own in terms of systemic um, oppressive structures, um, uh, embedded structures. I think that it's important for me to continue, continue, continue to work on my mind and work on how I re-engineer my thinking based off of just some of the things that I like embedded in there. Like that microchip response when you get, when you code switch or you, like I gotta continue to work on that because I wanna be a, a really good business person. Uh, and I strive to be, to be that. Uh, I think that another book that really does help me out too is, you know, really looking at things like classics, right? So like one of the books I read sometimes is The Innovation Secrets of Steve Jobs. Um, because regardless of race, creed, like you have to, you have to give credit to the imagination of a thinker like that. And I think that one of the things I, I recognize in that book is the power of simplicity. So for a person that does like sometimes do too much, it helps me to realize that if I'm doing too much, like they say, like back in the church, it's like the devil is the author of confusion. So if I'm doing too much, more than likely that is not the right decision. The decision that I need to take is basically eating that elephant one bite at a time. Like it's what is the simple thing that we can get to go so that we can move forward. And uh, I think those two are really special for me. Um, so I think for me, my, my work I find really grounded in black feminism um, and some of the, the great writers and thinkers and creatives, artists um, are black feminists. And so um, a book that I actually pulled is in my bag back there. Um, I pulled it this morning because um, I find that every time I'm about to go talk, I always pull this book because I think it, it helps me to remember what it is that I want to say, what feels important, what are the words that, I, that are um, important for me to share. Um, Teaching Community by Bell Hooks. Um, I love Bell Hooks' writing because it feels like although um, she is an academic, she writes in a way that's very accessible. Um, and to me, it speaks to me because although I carry this sort of like doctor, I'm talking to you like you are my people because this is how I talk. <laughs> and so um, thinking about that book, I think um, it really just kind of grounds into like what it means to actually teach um, us how to actually be in beloved, what she calls beloved community. Um, and so I think that that is a text that feels really important. Um, let's see, oh, there's another one that I am sort of in this practice of thinking about sort of collectivism and um, cooperatives and sort of like mutual aid. We didn't really talk about that aspect of things, but this, um, this, this the, the thread of mutual aid and it being a thing that black people have done for centuries um, there's a book called Collective Courage. Um, the name of the author is escaping me right now. Um, but if you look up Collective Courage, you should be able to find it. It feels like a sort of like um, a vast surveying of just black technology of mutual aid and being in cooperative space and sort of like thinking about um, how do we unhook from capitalism and hook back into some of the things that help us to sort of sustain um, in ways that feel more collective and more cooperative. Um, I love sharing resources, so if there are other things that you are interested in, I bet you I got a book or um, a link or a thing for it, so come and ask me. I have lots to share. Can we give our panelists a round of applause? Thank you all so much. Can I turn it, Maida? Uh, yeah, what a beautiful conversation. So uh, we were sweating that we didn't have our third panelist, but yo, this was, this was more than enough. This was beautiful. Um, and so, um, yeah, we're going to close here. I'm going to thank uh, Craig and Argie and Dr. Nick um, for your offerings. And um, just want to note that uh, this is, again, the, the first program that Honey Pot Performance and Chicago Black Social Culture Map is doing. Uh, here at the First Church as part of our space uh, partnership with the church. Uh, but we will be here uh, 
all year long and, and we hope beyond doing a performance um, and inviting other artists into the space to share their work and uh, our next uh, Chicago Black Social Culture Map um, event will be here on July 20th. Um, so we invite you back, we invite you to tell others, um, and you know, we wanna build this as a, a space of community and creativity on the west side. My family's from Fifth City, so like this place is really important to me as a, a place to have creativity flowing from. So um, <clears throat> as we wrap, are you gonna play the media burn clip with, uh, uh, was it Power Plant, Powerhouse, and Frankie Knuckles? And then we'll shift to Dwayne is our last performer of the evening. Yeah? Okay, cool. So we'll, we'll get that going and then um, enjoy um, the offerings and sounds of, of Dwayne before we close out for the evening. Oh, and if you want to, are you still ar archiving upstairs? Mm -hmm. So if you, if you have a story you want to share, a memory, something you want to digitize and add to the map, see Victoria. We, have our, we will always have community archiving on site when we are here, and we encourage people to bring things to continue to deepen that map. Um, yeah, cool. Thank you, everybody. All right. really that much different. See, the thing about it is that in the middle, like in the early, in the middle 70s, you know, in the uh, early 80s, um, it was all just going to be the thin. You know, there's so much stuff that was produced, I mean, and really produced well and put out on the market, you know, and the thing about it is that a lot of it got past the city, you know, and the city on a whole, but as far as like, you know, the warehouse was concerned, it was the only after I was put here. You know, and I was allowed to get away with anything I wanted to when it came to, you know, putting music on for them. You know, and people accepted that. It's, it's, originally was more like basement tapes type of a thing done on four tracks and, uh, you know, put together real quickly. And it's evolved a lot more into more 24 track recordings. And they gave a, it was a, an outlet, you know, for musicians who had never had an outlet to, to, you know, put their stuff on the air. They can put it, now they're putting it in the club. And it hits, a lot of it hits the clubs before it hits the radio market. What is house music? House music is a style of music that was created at a disco called The Warehouse in the early 70s. Early to late, well mid to late 70s. And it's a style of music that Frankie Knuckles created. House music to me represents yet another form of black music which is broken from the street into people's homes. House music is intrinsically the Chicago phenomenon. You can hear it. I mean, it's, all this music they're playing tonight has come out of Chicago. I would say house music is refined disco. It's refined discos, and it, you know, it's. I would say the beginning of the '90s with the new time, with the new sound of disco. You know, from the old old sound, which is very much what you say orchestrated. But with the new sound, which is basically, you would say, uh, one man operation, you know, that's, I think that's what house music really is. What, what a great groove, though. How hot is house music now? On a scale of 110, it's 12. <laughs>